Good afternoon, everyone. And it is my great pleasure to introduce Sir Anthony Selden, erstwhile 13th Master of Wellington College, a close colleague of mine for nearly 10 years, having been head of Brighton College prior to that. He is well known as a writer and editor of numerous books on a range of topics related to modern history, including the inside story on the last four prime ministers. Co-founder of Action for Happiness, Downing Street advisor, director of the Royal Shakespeare Company, chair of the National Archives Trust, and patron of several charities. Anthony is a mover and shaker, and we very much appreciate him speaking to us today. The title of his talk is Why British Education Needs a Reboot, and I'm sure we are all looking forward to hearing him speak. Without further ado, over to you, Sir Anthony. Thank you, Cressida, very much indeed, and very nice to be here at the Education Festival. Thank you to Ian, director, thanks to all the team, uh, not least, who've uh, made the last 10 minutes um, so calm, incredibly professional as we battle with the technology. And uh, thank you everyone for joining this. And look, uh, let's just take a mindful pause. At the end of your long day, eyes closed, inhale, and exhale. And one more for luck, just inhaling, and exhaling. Probably the, the most important thing I did for Wellington was try to get mindfulness more into it. And um, if we can be more mindful, we'll have better connections with the children and with colleagues and with ourselves. Um, it's very hard to find stillness. And it's the stillness, really. It's it's the it's the lack of um, of really quality thinking that has led me to give this talk today. I've never given this talk. I mean, I, bits of it I, I've covered in other talks, including at the festival two years ago um, about AI. Uh, but that's moved on a lot since. But. It's the sense that we're kind of on a treadmill with education. We're doing it because we've always done it. It's not really underpinned by what the children need. It's not really underpinned by what uh, teachers think. And it's not really underpinned by what the research says and as far as it says much. So this is a chance to really rethink what's happening in education. And we're at the biggest turning point. Uh, for over a hundred years. I mean, I think really going back to the 1902 Act, there was a very significant act in 1918, but really the 1902 Act and the creation of, uh, uh, of education into secondary age properly um, and thinking through, uh, what, why, why are we educating? What are we educating people for and why? Uh, and that's what we're gonna be looking at today. Uh, and I'm going to be exploring that with you. And I'm going to be asking you to become much more involved in the Education Commission. And, and do we realise that we're at this turning point? Because we are. Uh, and government never has time to think. The Education Department has precious little time to think. But we have to think. We have to ask ourselves fundamental questions. What are we educating young people for does it just exist inside schools does it stop at 18 or at 21 and and what have we learned that will help us do it much better in the years to come so um how, how good is the british education system well we hear a lot don't we like the nhs so you can't criticize it without being um, having a Twitter storm against you. But is an education system that fails uh, and tells uh, a third uh, of our children that they're failures uh, because they haven't got the required GCSEs, is that really a system? Are they the failures or are the people who are designing the system that's allowing them to fail, are they the failures? 
can tell what I think. Um, where a third of new teachers leave the profession, including many of the most talented teachers, many of the most sensitive, many of the most caring, many of the most uh, enlightened and brilliant, get crushed and leave. It's tragic. Uh, and a third of students going up to university reporting some kind of mental health condition. Why are we allowing that? How can we dare ha have the impudence to suggest we have a great education system when all this is happening? And then when it fails the majority of BAME, et cetera, LGBTQ and disadvantaged young people are not going getting a fair access to HG nor to professional jobs. It's not good enough. Um, so the question then is, why are we not doing? Uh, there's a lot, look, there's a great deal we do, uh, that you're doing, um, uh, that your schools are doing, uh, if you're in the schools, uh, which is incredibly good. Um, and we should never forget that. And not least during COVID, where uh, the profession has achieved standards of integrity and, and sacrifice unseen since the Second World War. But for all that, why are we not doing an even better job? And I would suggest it's because uh, we're being influenced overwhelmingly and without fully acknowledging it by the past. Uh, and the past seeps very deep into our conscious thinking and not by the future. And we need to be thinking about the present and the future. So there have been, um, there, there have been four revolutions that have happened. The first, the dawn of learning, um, where some five million years ago. Uh, the second, the dawn of educated uh, learning, where schools and universities uh, sprung up, the first university in Bologna in North Italy. Uh, and the third was the beginning of mass learning. And um, there you can see um, what factory schools were all like. And we're still living in that age um, with uh, still fundamentally the same as they were in 1600, with the teacher pretty much at the front, children pretty much in rows or in clumps of desks, teacher exposition, writing on the board, etc. And, and, and associating schools with bricks and mortar um, until that changes with the fourth education revolution. And uh, there, there, there are five massive problems that the model that we have at the moment is not solving. And they've all been exacerbated by COVID, as was inevitable, it, because the system is broken. It can't, it can't um, get over these problems. Social mobility is uh, still as significant as in 100 years ago, almost when that photograph was taken. And the, the sense of one size fits all, that, that we, we, we cram and we squeeze and we contort our students into moving ahead at the same stage, regardless of whether they can get hold of French, but they can't get hold of mass. Uh, and we have setting and streaming, but really it's just tip of the iceberg in terms of optimizing their learning. And of course, teacher administration uh, drowning out constantly. We're told that it's going to get easier. Very narrow focus on what intelligence is, more on that later. Uh, poor chap. And then we homogenize people. And we're surprised that we um, have so many mental health problems when we're not really interested in the nurturing of the individuation of each young person. We're, uh, we, there's really, we're just interested in them giving the right answer in the right way at the right time. We're interested in them being passive learners, not active learners, not really, and there's not really time to hear very much about what they genuinely think. Um, so, um, you know, in many ways, uh, in many, many ways, we're preparing our young people brilliantly. Uh, and above all, that fantastic work the students have done, but the, the staff have done also, and the governors and the support staff, uh, bring people brilliantly for the century that's gone. And it's no longer good enough. And we've come this once in a hundred year moment where we have to stand back. And I think there are six revolutions compelling us now to, to, to change. And, and the first is, is globalization. Um, 
That is, in fact, a uh, picture, as you can see there, of those of the seas in turquoise blue, um, uh, of the interconnected world, which, um, compared to even 2000, 21 years ago, uh, still less uh, 1979 or, or 1945, uh, we live in an intensely globalized world, and yet we carry on as if we live in a, a, a harshly nationalistic uh, world. The International Baccalaureate is a rare example of, of an examination and curriculum system that extends beyond frontiers. Um, the, the mental health uh, epidemic, which we've been talking about for many years, has hit us uh, with a vengeance during uh, COVID. It is agony. It's agony, as you all know, uh, to be a, a young person and suffer from mental health problems and to be their friends and to be the, the, their parents and, and their brothers and sisters. Uh, and so many get, um, uh, get, get, get caught up in, in that intensely um, hurtful and, and sad um, whirlpool and, and we carry on it's it's simply not acceptable to carry on with it um the next revolution is about learning and the brain uh, more on that later um the environmental crisis uh there uh from the world on the right to the world on the left uh, and how can we continue to, to 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 be having education systems which are not putting the environment at the very heart um, and, and then the very skills that we're developing young people for are oh, hopelessly ill-suited. I mean, what on earth out there in the real world approximates to sitting for three hours or two hours in a sports hall or examination hall uh, uh, and writing answers just on your own? Um, uh, and the AI and the fourth point naught uh, revolutions, both in the way that we're teaching, but also in the jobs we're preparing people for. So, um, so what's the matter with the existing education problem? Um, policy, it's very segmented, isn't it? You know, we teach early years, primary, secondary, further, higher, adult, as if they're all separate. They're not, they're not. It's very overly politicized. Labor does one thing, conservatives don't do another, or one education minister does one and they all react against. We've had 11 education secretaries in the last 20 years, far too many. Only two of those have actually hunkered down and may been able to make a difference. Um, often the politicization is not between different parties, but between education sectors of the same party. And uh, there's a, uh, this is actually the wrong set of slides. I, I did revise these. I, I put um, inadequate um, quality or uneven quality of much education research in the final uh, set of slides that I sent around. I'm sorry that these ones have been loaded up, but let's move ahead uh, now. I don't think it's fair to say it's low, it's, it's uneven. Um, and the blob has excluded outsiders, you know, employers, I mean, you know, get lost, employers, professional parents, even teachers have been uh, very excluded. Um, and the, the point I added there, which I think is not in there, is that, um, uh, is that the, um, uh, number 10, uh, that doesn't have time. The Department for Education think tanks don't have time, don't have the capacity to really think through what education um, is about. Um, they're so obsessed with the latest crisis, uh, sometimes thrust upon them as with COVID, other times a crisis of their own uh, making. They're not putting in the deep and the long-term thinking, and neither are the think tanks. So globalization, well, uh, just taking this through, it's been very insular, hasn't it? Um, we don't learn from schools and institutions around the globe. Um, uh, there's Mark Zuckerberg, it's out schools, um, summit public schools, there's so much to teach us what they're doing in state school. People at the Khan Lab, you've heard, I don't know, of the Khan Lectures, but the Khan Lab School uh, did some very interesting things. Riverbend in Chennai is a hugely interesting school. Uh, uh, this primary here that's, that's monitoring here, uh, uh, Xinhua, uh, mispronounced, um, is monitoring uh, the brain activity of children um, and was overly intrusive. Squirrel, you'll be familiar with in the way that Squirrel is beginning to transform education. 
and um, Spark Schools of South Africa, Geeky in Brazil, uh, what's happening in Estonia, what's happening in Finland, what's happening in um, Singapore, and also what's happening in China. Um, and, and China's interesting. Let me want to pick up one thing about China. China is deeply interested in learning from others. All we're interested in is learning about maths and how we can uh, bludgeon brains even more intensely on maths. There's some very good things, by the way, about what's happening in Shanghai maths, but that's all that we're interested in. China is fascinated and has been for 20 years by what's been happening uh, in schools around the world, particularly Britain, uh, and which is why it's been so keen on having schools not least Wellington College, out there in China, studying them minutely as if it's a car breaking down every single component part to try and understand it better. If we have that same determination to understand what's happening uh, and trying to pick up on the, on the best, I think that would be a lot more healthy. But we're, we're, we're not globalised. Uh, if anything, we're becoming smaller and narrower. Um, despite great work, I don't mean to be critical of, of, of the department, Ministry of Department of, of Education, lots of good things going on, but there isn't the capacity to think long-term, think broadly sufficiently. Well, the mental health uh, epidemic, um, as you know, before the pandemic, before COVID, almost 2 million mental health treatment sessions provided to under 18s, uh, that went up 20%. Um, and young minds found 67% of that age group uh, have long-term negative mental health effects. I mean, it, it, it's really shocking. It, it, it's absolutely, and all of you will know young people affected. And then learning about the brain. Uh, GCSEs were designed in the 1980s uh, no longer matches what we know about the brain. Um, the, the science, the learning science is entirely wrong, says Sarah Jane Blakemore, one of the 22 commissioners on the uh, Education Commission uh, of, of the Times. Um, it's simply not, it's simply, the exam doesn't work. It doesn't, it, it, it's no longer it, uh, are relevant. It, 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 it's a, a petrol system in, in an age of, of, of electric cars. Uh, brain development isn't linear. You probably know that, I'm sure you do. Um, and um, the adolescent brain reorganizes itself and we need to uh, take awareness of that including the high level cognitive processes planning self-awareness understanding other people um we need to know so much more hard wiring in uh teacher development so that we can keep up as do medics with with, with educational sorry with health medical advances why don't we do that in education um we've also uh we need to have a much wider broader vision of what human intelligence is. So um, we have at the University of Breslau wanted to devise an intelligent quotient, the IQ test, and had a very narrow, mean, um, I think degrading notion of what intelligence was. Uh, and it, the education system is built all around that, whereas what we should be doing is building it around the logical and linguistic uh, intelligences. Uh, we should be building it around the social and the personal intelligence. And, and a big reason why we have so many mental health problems is that young people don't know uh, how to organize themselves. They might be very good at their physics or their history, but they're not very good with themselves. Uh, uh, and if we did all this much better in schools, we would be doing it much better um, uh, we'll be doing it much better uh, for um, preparing them for university, if they go to university and for life. We don't do enough on the moral and spiritual um, intelligences and we don't do enough on the physical nor the cultural intelligences. There are eight different uh, forms of intelligence there in four sets of pairs and um, so I, 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 th th this is what, what our education has become uh, narrowed down to. Education, the word means, as you know, it means opening out, it means leading out what's in there, all those latent potentialities. And if they are not developed at school, if we're fixated 
by that obsession with the sports hall exam at the end, the GCSE and the A level, um, which are such bad systems and so out of date and so demeaning to young people in terms of who they are, what they can do. If we let that continue, uh, then is it surprising that we're going to um, have young people who can't manage themselves better, um, better. Um, so uh, on we go then to the environmental crisis. Um, and um, w we are sadly um, building schools for the still schools like that 1950s school, uh, even the, the schools that built this century are no longer fit for purpose. We should be designing schools like this, uh, which are green schools. And uh, I've seen recently quite a number of schools and new blocks, uh, which are totally 20th century. Um, we, uh, and, and they will simply no longer work optimally as we go forward. We need to be designing 21st century schools. And um, th th then what do employers need? Well, um, automation is replacing all the jobs, robots, um, but it's not just, uh, it's not just the, the, the lower school level's jobs. As these people, the Oxford Martin School, a whole series of reports, David Deming's very important Harvard paper in 2015, shows that the very skills that GCSEs and A-levels are testing are the very skills that the algorithms will be able to replicate. Uh, far better. Study after study after study after study is showing that we are teaching the wrong things. Two very important reports in 2019 uh, from the OECD and the CIPD, um, Judge Institute of Personal, uh, Personal Development, were showing that we're teaching the wrong things. And then last year came Daniel Susskind's very important book, A World Without Work, uh, which is talking about a society increasingly without jobs, reliant on universal basic income. It's the university level jobs which are now on the firing line, not the manual jobs. Um, yet universities and schools are still contributing uh, on the skills that they had before. And then you've got the AI revolution. It consists of the following, uh, the four point note, artificial intelligence, whole cluster machine learning, virtual reality, augmented reality and mixed reality, all of which are very different, transhumanism, robotics, voice and face recognition, quantum computing, which vastly accelerates the power of traditional computing, collaborative learning, internet of things, and collective intelligence goes with collaborative learning, the IoT, big data and blockchain. And this has, in the process of already transforming healthcare, it's transforming transport, shopping, law firms, accountancy, agriculture, and banking, but it's not sufficiently transforming education. And there's significant ethical issues uh, with uh, all of this. Um, uh, AI is infinitely seductive. Uh, just if you just read that, I think there's a break from my voice. Sorry, that's gone too quickly. Um, so so uh, another reason why everyone needs to be very involved with what's happening is because uh, of the profound moral um, issues around this whole cluster of new technologies, which are uh, learn themselves in ways that we do not always understand ourselves. Uh, they can be uh, they can overcome many of the uh, five deep disadvantages with the traditional system, with the factory model that I ran through. But if we don't uh, get on top of them, they will severely damage our young people even more than the traditional um, uh, devices and digitalization has done. So children used to be safe in their homes and in their bedrooms um, 20 years ago, uh, for those of you with younger children. Uh, and then in started coming the gadgets and the handhelds uh, and they were no longer so safe. So the 3.0 revolution 
made them much more vulnerable. Their bedroom now became equivalent to a hut in a wasteland. And 4.0 will strip away the hut. Even the hut now will have gone. The young person will be totally exposed. And because of these fears and because of the desire to ensure that we maximize the chance of these new technologies benefiting young people, trying, especially the most disadvantaged, trying to give every single child a, a King Solomon Academy or a, 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 an Eaton-style education that we devised this here, the Institute for the Ethics of AI in Education, which um, I set up with Priya Lakhani of Century, somebody will know that, um, our company and uh, Rose Luckin uh, of UCL. Uh, and, and this was reported earlier this year. Um, it was in, in many ways the forerunner of the Times Education Committee Commission uh, in terms of trying to get ahead and think ahead. Well, Stephen Hawking said that uh, AI is going to either be the best or the worst thing for humanity. Um, and every aspect of our lives are going to be transformed by what's happening in AI. Um, and Elon Musk said that it's the biggest risk that we face. It isn't just AI, it's all those other 12 different technologies which are now coming in. Um, the British government understands the impact of AI on transport, health, industry it genuinely doesn't understand it does not understand how it's going to affect education that's why all of you uh, need to understand it uh, it doesn't understand the impact on the jobs that our schools and further education and higher education institutions are preparing young people for and how they're going to be completely transformed by it and the skills that are needed, that they're going to need to be able to cope, not just at work, but in life. Uh, and we carry on with this bludger, bludgeoning, hammer-like uh, education system that we all have to stand up and applaud. Um, and, uh, and it was not good enough 25 years ago, it wasn't good enough 10 years ago, and it most certainly isn't good enough after COVID. Um, so with AI, we're talking about the way that schools teach and students learn. Um, we're also talking about the jobs and the society that they're going to go into. So those are the six different factors operating that led us to want to set up the Times Education Commission. Um, those factors, uh, I can, I'm quickly going to go back through the whole thing, if you can stand it at the end. Uh, in reverse. Uh, so the Times Education Commission, we've got 22 uh, commissioners, Tim Schmidt of the Eden Project, um, well known because the Caris Bay G7, if you didn't come across them before, chaired by Rachel Sylvester, uh, um, uh, award-winning journalist at the Times. Um, we're going to spend a year uh, on this with an interim report coming out in the next three months and then the final report coming out next June. We don't think that we can spend, have the luxury of 10 years or even five years uh, on it. And it, we're making the very practical recommendations and we need you to be help us and to be involved with it. Um, we're looking at these following areas, if these are in interest for you, the purpose of education, social mobility, um, including the attainment gap, early years, we're looking at, it's very broad, what children learn in the curriculum. We're looking at how children learn, um, teaching and pedagogy. We're looking at forms of assessment and how assessment can be genuinely useful in uh, furthering their learning and understanding. Um, we're looking at the relationship with the community and how we can build in lifelong learning and how we can involve parents much more uh, in learning, as well as the question of faith schools, very controversial, and how we can get schools that are properly in tune with the environment, harvesting some of their own energy, uh, uh, growing some of their own crops, having uh, livestock, yes, even deep uh, schools deep, deep, deep in the city, so that young people who 
are not used to farm animals, not used to crops, can understand the rhythm and cycle of nature, and of course, not forgetting dogs, not least the mental health benefit of dogs. Uh, we're going to be looking at mental health and well-being, understanding how optimally to deal with that, the role of AI and technology, more generally, exclusion and alternative provision, and special education needs, and we're looking at further education and higher education. Um, how can you help? Well, we'd like you to become actively involved in educational change um, because um, teachers have been excluded for too long. We would like you to follow up progress. We'd like you to write to us with your ideas. Uh, look at our website. You'll see exactly where to write to rather than me giving it here. Um, we want you to tell us about your experience. We want you to tell us what works in your experience best and why, and why it works. We want you to talk to your colleagues about it. We want you to talk about in the classroom and involve your students and um, uh, your parents, that should say. Uh, we want, uh, that involves the parents there because they're important and often excluded and engage with us on social media. Um, so we are. Um, and right to Rachel Sylvester. Um, Rachel Sylvester, I mentioned, is the chair of it. She's very, very um, interested in hearing. If we get this right, it's going to be, uh, we will accelerate change. Uh, we think the government is avid to, to make changes, but constantly gets snowed, down, snowed under by the deluge for everything that it has to consider. Um, and that's the end. And because um, being a good um, uh, Elliot uh, supporter in the end is our beginning, we're just going to just, just very quickly flash back. Uh, how can you help? Those are the ways that you can help us. So, so um, uh, that, those are the 10 areas that we're looking at on the commission. We'd like to know what you think about in all those areas. Um, that's how it's constituted. Please write to us. Please let us know. The British government doesn't understand, hasn't, isn't construed to understand fully the impact of what's happening. We are really worried about AI and how we can get ahead on AI and ensure that it really is a benefit of all students um, and not uh, just the, the most privileged. Um, we believe that uh, AI is the Cinderella um, of the system. So that is the sixth of the changes. Uh, the fifth is the fact that these jobs are disappearing as quickly as these slides are now disappearing off your screen. And what are we doing um, apart from having our heads in the sand if we're not thinking through what are we educating people for? It's in part because of the pure joy of learning about astronomy and learning about history and learning about music and about language and about mathematics. It's also about helping them think through what they might want to do in life. How can they contribute? Uh, how can their characters develop uh, so that we can ensure that they are going to be making positive rather than negative contributions to society? What are they going to need to be able to develop? Uh, and we're not doing enough on that. So that's the AI Four point noise is one of the reasons. Changing skills is the second reason. Uh, this reason here is the fact that we've got an environmental crisis. We need to hard bake the environment, which is the third factor coming the other way around. We need to hard bake that into everything that we do at school, every single thing. We've got to stop building schools and classrooms and have the mentality of the 20th century. Uh, we need to develop all these different intelligences, particularly from our youngest. Howard Gardner said, and you all know it, don't ask how intelligent a child is, ask rather how are they intelligent. Maybe they're personally highly intelligent. Maybe they're socially highly intelligent. The social skills are precisely the skills that are going to be needed that the algorithms will never replicate. And, and there we have the logical and linguistic, which form 90% of what happens in schools. Um, and that narrow vision. The learning about the brain, the fact that uh, uh, we're simply way out of 
way out of kilter uh, work, work with uh, our education system, with what we now know. There's a, an enormous gap in terms of uh, understanding uh, the curriculum, understanding uh, assessment procedures, understanding examinations, understanding what schools are for, for, for from where the evidence now is. The whole mental health, um, terribly frightening uh, system and then the globalization. All these countries are doing things, all these systems are doing things that we need to be learning more about with globalization. So those are the six factors. Um, the, the problems with the education system, that it's too politicized, it's too narrow, it's too segmented. Um, uh, here again, just are those six factors which made us think that we need to have the Education Commission uh, if one one image just stays in your mind from this talk, might it be that one? Um, and those are the six revolution, revolutions that uh, we all understand. We've got a 20th century education system. Um, when the system homogenizes young people, but that never works, it doesn't individuate them. Such a narrow sense of what human capability, potentiality uh, is all about. Um, teachers exhausted, um, a third leaving early, and far too many quitting, broken down, and heads and school leaders broken down uh, by a system uh, which is uh, only exaggerated by COVID. One size <laughs> doesn't, doesn't fit all every single child as individual. And um, we really, uh, social mobility has gone down ill. Um, the factory model no longer works. The fourth revolution is now here, but we don't realize it. We're still living in a, a, a model fundamentally like that. Um, Indeed, I wonder sometimes whether one or two education ministers wish you know, would have that up on their wall or something to emulate. Uh, lots and lots of discipline um, and passive learning, uh, but no deep learning. Uh, the second revolution, which was the organised schools and the beginning of learning uh, there. So we must be involved and motivated by the future and the present, not by the past. Um, uh, we must solve these problems, telling students, stop telling students their failures, stop binning uh, many of our best teachers who quit, uh, stop uh, a third of our young people developing mental health problems. At last be fair to those young people uh, who come from BAME and disadvantaged and other backgrounds, a system that, that honours them and, and treats them with respect and, and fairly. We are finishing where we've begun, which is the revolution, the biggest turning point in a hundred years, and do we realise it? Uh, that's the end of the talk after 40 minutes, Cressida, precisely. Oops, I'm just wondering, um, can you hear me now, Sir Anthony? <laughs> I can, yeah, absolutely. Lovely, thank you. Um, yes, um, there are a few questions here, if you don't mind. Um, no, no, I, I, I kept my 40 minutes so that we'd have 20 minutes for questions. Great, so um, a first question here for, is, is from Andy, who's asking if GCSEs are no longer fit for purpose, is IB and the NYP the solution? Andy, um, I mean, there, there are two debates. Aren't there? One is, should we be testing children at 16 at all if the majority are staying on till 18 when one of the reasons for testing at 16 was they were leaving at 16 and they'd have something if they were not staying on for A-levels? Um, that's one debate. I don't know where you stand on that. And the other is, um, should GCSEs continue as they are? Um, and very much, and we'd love to hear from you, Andy, what you think on both those questions. Do we need an exam at 16? Uh, and if we do need an exam, should it be GCSEs continuing uh, in the current uh, format uh, with changes every time changes, not because of research evidence, but um, political uh, whim and political ideologies and, and a sense about, uh, not based on deep research about what parents think, but often uh, guided by newspapers and uh, 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 and you know, what do you think? Um, should our GCSEs write? Should they 
adapt. Uh, what do I think? I, I think um, it's not unhelpful to have uh, something at 16. We did have, um, when I was at Wellington, we did have the Middle Years Programme. Um, and I think that was a system that had a lot of benefits. It wasn't perfect. The IB itself really liked the Middle Years Programme even more than the diploma. I do like the IB, uh, partly because it's international and our uh, young people live in one world. Um, and that will simply increase and increase year by year. Um, and because it's six subjects rather than three at A-levels and because it does have a science, it does have a language, it does have a creative subject. Um, uh, and there's a benefit from carrying on the science and, and maths. It does have the theory of knowledge. So you are thinking in a metacognitive way about what learning uh, is. It, it's not perfect. Um, but, you know, over, over to you, Andy, to you and the others. Please let us know what you think. Please talk to your colleagues and, and, and let us know. Okay. And, um, on that, um, somebody's asked if you could provide um, us with Rachel's contact details um, following your invitation to, to, to write. Uh, uh, absolutely. What we'll do there um, is if uh, people, everybody, uh, look on the website, but also, Christopher, is it possible for you to write around with the email address? Um, the uh, um, yeah. Yeah. best email address, um, uh, which would be, uh, which we can send around. You know, that's how we'd like to hear from you. Uh, we're beginning to hear more and more from teachers. Um, we're having a number of roundtables around the country. Um, we're involving teachers, we're involving students um, and parents we're doing a lot of surveys. There was a survey reported in the Times today um, talking about the length of school day. We're trying to test um, more than ever what, what parents themselves think. Yeah, and, uh, and Andy's come back and said that, you know, teachers and experts um, do there is this this narrative about um, GCSEs and education in the UK needing to change, but it poses the question, when will it actually change? And I think that's obviously a question that many of us have on our minds. Well, Andy, I think the answer is, if we can really get behind and show that there's a massive head of steam in the profession, uh, in the country, in the uh, work of educational psychologists, in deep psychology grounded in studying the brain and in psychology about what would be a better system, how on earth can government carry on as it is at the moment? Great, well, thank you. And um, just to go on to different topics, um, there's a question here about what are the practical ways in which we can prepare young people to overcome emotional challenges? Uh, thank you for that question. So, um, at Wellington, the, the talk which I meant to put up, which is only very slightly different, included um, a slide of Ian Morris, who uh, has written, when I was at Wellington, he was head of well-being and started the well-being classes 15 years ago um, and wrote a book called Learning How to Ride Elephants, uh, which talks about... Um, positive psychology and how to um, bring young people on to give them more efficacy over their own lives, to help them uh, learn to develop, not in a way that makes them more flimsy and insecure, but builds their capacity. Um, and um, so uh, I think looking at, uh, at action for happiness, um, the website of Action for Happiness, looking at the website of IPEN, I-P-E-N, which is the International Positive Education Network, looking at the work of the Jubilee um, Centre at the University of Birmingham uh, about how to build character and virtue. All of these are very solidly evidence-based ways. I mean, clearly, if we hollow out from schools, the, the, the moral and the broad dimension, the creativity, uh, the arts, sport, character, leadership, debating, uh, teamwork, 
public speaking, volunteering, if we narrow it down just to uh, core knowledge and, and, and exams, um, we're, we're, we're going to have a very narrow sense and we're not going to be turning up people who, who will know so much how to uh, live positively with other people. We can, Aristotle onwards, knew that uh, the teaching of character was at the heart of what good education means. Um, so those would be the three places, the Jubilee Centre, Action for Happiness and IPEM that I'd look to, and indeed Ian Morrison's work, Ian Morris's work at the University of Wellington. Um, and good luck. And, and many listening today will be quite far down the well-being road. I think that it, it can become self-indulgent in, in some plans and young people can clearly get weary of talking about their feelings too much so that there that there's there are very good systems and they're not very good systems out there um, we need to uh, promulgate what those good systems are so that when they come to university if they are on 50 percent coming to university or going to further education or going out into, into uh, the world they have they're better equipped to, to know how to handle themselves and to relate to others well and to to be good and, and, and constructive positive members of society um okay N next topic i'm yes. raising yeah uh, thank you um Press. so uh there's another question about higher education specifically. So what, what, what are the implications of education 4.0 on the higher education institutions in the UK and what needs to be done to be more prepared specifically? Well, I mean, um, higher education um, gets knocked a lot. Um, the, 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 the media have fallen out of love with it government has fallen out of love with HE and yet suddenly there the pandemic comes along and we realise how much we need the research of universities. Um, so uh, universities would say they're underfunded uh, to do the broader work uh, that we're talking about here of education. Um, education, higher education is clearly under attack also from, uh, um, for, for, from employers who are wanting to recruit uh, students who recognize that if you're an accountancy firm or a solicitors, you can train people much better uh, from the age of 18 um, in what they're wanting to, to know, to teach them about, rather than have them going off and studying finance or law or business or, or, or accountancy for three years of university and then training them up. Um, so more and more are going to be training themselves, uh, more and more apprenticeships, uh, more and more perhaps not going to university, and yet the evidence is that uh, the numbers are still edging up for HE. So, uh, but why would anyone go to university uh, when the lectures you can get online, the seminars you can participate in online, the libraries you can uh, access online, the exams and tests you can sit online? Um, and so I think we're going to see not, I think, uh, a, a changed university system, as we'll see a changed school and college system uh, fundamentally over the next 10 years. And frankly, the more that they change, the better, because change is overdue. We still have a 20th century university model in this country. Um, okay. Brilliant. Thank you. I think it's more of a challenge than anything. Um, it says, um, as a question from what? Well, a thought from Bailey. Um, Bailey. Said, Education in a world without work, a system in which bourgeois kids learn to code while the plebs learn about breathing techniques ready for their life on UBI. I'm just wondering um, what <laughs> what you, your thoughts are on that reflection, Anthony. Uh, was that Bailey? Yeah. Um, Bailey, um, well, I, I share your concerns. I, I mean, uh, are we going to have just people playing computer games uh, or watching pornography uh, or um, watching endless re repeats of friends? Um, that could happen if we don't, um, uh, if our schools don't open the hearts and minds so that um, people become curious themselves about I mentioned astronomy, about the environment, about nature, about history, about biology, about culture. The more 
that we can help active learners become naturally curious what what Mill talked about, about the higher pleasures uh, in life, the more we can develop uh, with our young people that curiosity that so often gets squeezed out of the education system at the moment, not always, uh, but so often, then I think the more we'll have um, people, even if there are uh, less jobs around, who want to do positive things, who want to become involved, who know, who know for themselves that uh, to, 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 to a life that's well lived is a life that is, is, is valuable to other people, that is in harmony uh, with yourself and with your own body and, and with, with other people around you. And a life that's unhappy is a life where you're not in harmony with your body, you're not in harmony with your family and, uh, and your friends or with your communities or with the environment. Um, and so... Um, uh, we, that's why we need to be teaching young people. Nobody knows the world. I mean, it's hard enough to know the world uh, of uh, late June uh, 2021, uh, let alone the world of 2031 and 2041. And yet, uh, and yet, if we can develop those natural instincts of goodness, of, of, of fellow feeling, of good character, of deep interest in the sciences, in mathematics, in language, in the arts, then even if um, the machines will take over, and that's a big if, um, uh, more and more uh, of the physical and the intellectual work, then there'll still be uh, enormous uh, interest to, to at last to enjoy the, 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 the fascinating universe and world in which we live, would, would be barely my answer. Okay, next question. I know I'm doing yes. this. I'll, I'll, can I do two together, Anthony, so yes. that we can um, finish? Oh, absolutely. Yes, I'll be even quicker. Yeah. Um, so a question from Miriam. Uh, is the government really ready and searching for a possible solution to where we are currently or too anxious of risking a well-established process? Um, and then from Annabelle, um, will the um, Commission work link in with other groups, Rethinking Assessment, FED and others, um, I suppose there's a concern that groups, lots of groups, could, could result in fragmentation. Okay, um, two great questions. Miriam, uh, the question there about are government ready? Well, you know that's the issue about government. Governments change. Why are, are crises the biggest catalyst for change? The First World War, the Boer War led to the 1902 Act I referred to at, at, at the beginning, where the recognition that you needed people to be of physical better health and to know more, to be able to cope and fight and compete um, against rising Germany and, and Japan and America. Uh, the First and Second World War, the medical, the scientific, technological advances. So, so governments tend not to move unless they are forced to. And, and you know, maybe a silver lining from COVID will be it will force government to recognise that, that, that the education system, for all its current strengths, for all its current strengths, is fundamentally malaligned because of the six uh, factors impinging on it, which I went through at the beginning and at the end. Um, and then Annabelle's question uh, there, we are working with Fed. Um, we're aware, you may be aware of more, uh, we've obviously got the Pearson Commission, which is very specific on assessment, I think. Um, we've got Fed, if you come across Fed, and we've also got uh, the big change, the Richard Branson organisation, which is a much longer timescale as of the Fed. So we're talking to the big change, Richard Branson, and to the Fed, and we are, you know, the, the, we're, we are the, 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 the group that, uh, who are going to prepare the way coming in very quickly with recommendations across the waterfront. Another reason why we need uh, you to help us as much as possible. Okay, time for more questions. Um, uh, I think these are just uh, reflections more than anything and, and thanking you for the inspiration and, and, your talk, and, and ask whether you have encountered what schools could be. I don't know if that's one that you- uh, Ask what, Chris? If you've encountered what schools can be, um, it's echoing after. No, I, I'd love to hear about, I, I don't think I have, or we have, we'd love to hear about that. Can you can you write and let us know? And and to repeat that point, and, and I've just seen the time, it is, um, it is 6.30, it's very easy to lose sight of the time when you're talking, uh, my apologies, but we, um, we'll send around the um, uh, 
uh, the address to write to. It's also on the website. And can I just finish, Chris, by stressing that, that if we're to make this difference, we, we, we try not to be left or right, um, pro-Brexit or anti-Brexit. You know, we're trying just to put the interests of the children, students, uh, and learning of all ages, whether you're 92. When I ran a university, the 92 year old was the oldest student I had, uh, at, you know, from two to 92 or from zero or from you know, prenatal, um, uh, 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 that, that there's learning that's going on. We're, we're trying to, 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 to think of the learner, think of particularly the vulnerable and the disadvantaged. How can we have a really powerful shock that government will not be able to ignore, partly because we're underpinning a lot of our work with uh, very significant uh, surveys of teachers and of uh, parents and of students so that we can show that what we're talking about is popular uh, and will be valued and respected. Perhaps that's enough for me. I'd love to hear uh, from all of you. And thank you very much at the end of a long uh, day um, uh, for listening in and, and all the best for the rest of the term, everybody. Just want to thank you, Swansea. Uh, just such an interesting uh, title, how to set a better course for our education system, what could be more important. And I particularly enjoyed your emphasis on the need for um, developing skills for employment. I, I think that is, that's, that's something really important. Something that really resonated also was that the, the point you made about education being over-politicized, and it just doesn't help us, us make any progress. So you did a great job of challenging us to think more broadly. And I know that everyone will join me in extending the most sincere thank you um, to you. And uh, we look forward to welcome you back again soon. Thank you, Cressida, to you. Thank you to Ian. Thank you to the, the, the whole uh, festival, Education Festival team. The Education Festival is a brilliant event in everyone's life. And thank you. Uh, for making it so great, despite all the handicaps you've had. Uh, and good luck to everybody for the, for the rest of the term. Thank you. Enjoy, enjoy summer when it comes. Thank you. You too. Bye-bye. <laughs>It's my great honour to welcome you all. It is a very prestigious award. It means the world to me. They have great senses of humour. I like to reveal parts of history to them before. I love making history come alive. They are some of the best people that you can come across. To help them open their hearts. I always come back to this quote. How can we be role models to learners if we're not learners ourselves? It's quite useful to get out of our bubbles, not our COVID ones, and sort of see what else is out there. By sharing best practice, we can see the whole picture. We can see what really matters. easy to forget how much has to happen behind the front lines. As a global schools group, Cognita educates over 55,000 students across 12 countries. We're proud to be Wellbeing Partner at this year's Festival of Education, and we want to share the work that we're doing to prioritise children's well-being. This starts with a clear understanding of what well-being is. We looked at the evidence and created a simple Be Well Charter that everyone can use day to day. It gives a clear definition of well-being and then focuses on the specific contributors that influence it. Discover our full Be Well Charter video and other resources to use with your students and families at cognita.com. I really try to not look at myself as just a science teacher. I feel like as a teacher, it's, it's very important to help students grow and develop outside of your lessons.
a single teacher believing in you and really believing in you. One teacher doing that can have a large impact, but if you have one or two or three all telling you that and really, really believing in it, it makes you feel like you can achieve anything in the world, honestly.